Next up, we have Dr. Guy Champness. Uh, Guy is a social psychologist. He's head of behavioral science with in in Inzio, a global consulting firm that works predominantly, again, in healthcare. In addition, Guy is a visiting professor with IE Business School in Madrid, as well as visiting fellow with Cranford School of Management here in the UK, where he designs and delivers master's and MBA courses on sustainable behavior. Uh, welcome, Guy. Um, and in terms of your little secret for your colleagues, you were an extra on Four Weddings and a Funeral, which I have to say is one of my favorite films. Um, so over to you, Guy. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Um, great. Uh, very good to be here and to see everyone. Um, if we could just jump onto the next slide. Uh, we've, we've pretty much done this already, but as Mark just mentioned, yes, I spent most of my time working with Anisio um, and a couple of uh, posts with uh, business schools or universities. And I also act as an advisor for a couple of um, startups that are looking to try and change consumer household behaviour uh, to be more sustainable. If we go on to the next slide, um, this slide has probably been used quite a lot in presentations here in the past, but there is fundamentally what many see as this dangerous gap between what people say they're going to do and then what they go on to do when it comes to sustainable behaviour. And this throws a lot of people, if we have the next slide, please, because we do see, you know, very high numbers, <coughs> excuse me, 80% globally, a little bit higher in the UK, of people telling us that they really care about the environment uh, or that they're really concerned about it and, and about climate change. So the question then comes, well, why, why don't we see this translation from these high levels of concern through to uh, sort of behavior on the ground? To a behavioral scientist or a psychologist, this isn't hugely surprising that we don't see this, um, this flowing through the behaviors for the simple reason that attitudes are actually not that great at predicting our behavior. In other words, what we hear people saying about what they care about would probably not translate most of the time, or certainly a lot of the time, into behavior. In that respect, if we have the next slide, please, if we focus on attitudes, um, we're sort of getting into the realms really of sort of tarot card reading. No disrespect to anyone who reads tarot cards um, today, but you know, attitudes are not great predictors. In fact, some research tells us that attitudes will predict our behavior a little bit less than 50% of the time. So we're sort of engaging in a toy cost exercise. If we are thinking about if we can get attitudes in place, we'll then see the behaviors we want to see. Now, what I'd like to do in this little slot, if we have the next slide, is talk about the way that maybe behavioral science, you know, applied psychology, essentially social psychology, maybe this gives us a chance to, to not have to make this jump, this dangerous leap that tries to get us from, okay, we've got the attitudes in place from people, are we now gonna see the behaviors you want to see? And I think that rather than making this jump, we can actually quite easily just walk around the edge of this in some respects and not expose ourselves constantly to this risk. It's what many businesses call the sustainability liability because they focus so much on trying to shift attitudes, but they then don't see the behaviors coming through instead. So if we go on to the next slide, the first one is instead of worrying about attitudes, can we just look to tweak or change the social environment? And if we have the next slide, this is an example, um, which is probably very well known to a lot of people on this call. This company called Opower, now owned by Oracle. This was a company looking to change behavior around energy saving. Um, uh, it all came out of one single experiment um, a number of years ago, where they'd been trying to persuade people to use less energy at home. They told them about the fact that obviously the more you use, the more you pay. It asked them to think about the environmental costs. They'd even said that actually, if you continue to put this much strain on the grid, we're going to have to build another power station. If we build another power station, those costs ultimately end up on your bill as well. None of this messaging worked to get people to use less energy at home. So the psychologists instead said, well, actually, as well as you seeing how much energy you've used, we're now going to show you how much people have used on average in your street. And without even asking people to save energy, what they saw there was actually those people that were using more than the average reduced their consumption. So in some ways, exposing people to this extra piece of information, in some ways making the behavior social or visible, was enough to get the behavior change without specifically asking for the behavior change. And this particular mechanism is called a, a descriptive norm. In other words, it's basically presenting a piece of information that allows us for the first time to see what other people are doing. And we can't help ourselves most of the time, but to move towards uh, doing that same behavior or doing the behavior to the same level. Now, in this particular case, 
It was looking at uh, uh, what we call a sort of salient reference group, which was your neighbours. But it doesn't have to be your neighbours. If we have the next slide, uh, what we've done is since run some uh, research that shows that actually you can convene consumers or individuals into what we call sort of rapidly formed groups. And if there's some criterion for membership, by people going to that group, they then start to do things in accordance with what that group was set up to do. Now, in our particular case, we convened a group about around people being creative. We allocated people at random to this group, but they felt as if they were being admitted because they were more creative. And then we gave them a sustainability task and they basically worked harder at that task because it was an opportunity to demonstrate what the group stood for, which was creativity. And crucially, it's worth mentioning that we controlled for any pro-environmental or pro-sustainability attitude. So we still saw people engaging in sustainable behaviour, not because of their attitudes towards sustainability, but because actually suddenly their behaviours were becoming a lot more social. OK, if we go on to the next slide, the second one is to think about tweaking the physical environment instead. Uh, now, what do we mean by that? Well, if we go on to the next slide, um, a lot of our behaviours are a particular type of behaviour. And to illustrate that, um, there's a very short case study involving popcorn. And essentially, the world is divided into two types of people, those who eat popcorn when they go to the cinema and those who don't. And uh, they ran an experiment where, uh, unbeknownst to the group that were invited in, half of the group were people who ate popcorn and half were those who didn't. And the cover story for the experiment was you're going to watch a series of film trailers and we want to get your views on this. And to say thank you, we're going to give you free popcorn going into the cinema. Uh, everyone went to the cinema. There are cameras dotted around the, uh, um, the, 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 the actual cinema itself. What people didn't realise was the popcorn was stale. And they wanted to see what happened. Now, those people who were not regular popcorn eaters took one mouth of the popcorn, realised it was stale, it tasted awful, and they just left it. Those who were regular eaters took one mouthful and then took another and another, and they finished their popcorn. Now, how could that possibly be that one group of people left it, one group carried on? The answer lies in the fact that actually, for those people that regularly eat popcorn, uh, it is a habit. And habits are a very, very interesting breed of behaviour. If we go on to the next slide, um, because essentially habits are fired by context. They don't rely on information. They don't rely on your level of education. They don't draw on awareness or attitudes. It's driven by context. In that particular case, the context was very vivid. It was a movie theatre, a cinema, it was dark, and I had a popcorn in my hand, and so they kept eating it. Now, if we stop and think a second about trying to encourage people to engage in sustainable behaviours, the fact that habits don't rely on education and attitudes should give us all you know, good reason to, to pause for a moment and think about whether what we're doing is going to be the most effective. There's one more reason why we should think very careful about habits, if you have the next slide, and that is that by some um, uh, 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 studies, they make up around 50% of our daily, daily behaviours. So they are incredibly influential and they don't respond to education or attitudes. They fire entirely on context. Now, as a result of that, how might we then change that sort of behaviour? Well, very briefly, going back to the popcorn study, uh, they, they ran the study again with another group of people, ostensibly the same sample, 50% regular eaters, 50% not. Everything was exactly the same, but this time they said, okay, when you go into the movie theatre, please have this free popcorn from us. All we ask you to do is eat it with your non-dominant hand. So if you're right handed with your left and vice versa. Those people that aren't regular eaters, again, took one mouthful, realised the popcorn was stale and left it. Those who were habitual eaters took one mouthful of the popcorn and they also left it. Why? Because asking them to use their other hand was just enough friction put into that context that the habit was momentarily broken and then suddenly their preferences, I don't like eating stale popcorn, came to the fore and influenced their behaviour. And if we have the next slide, just one more example of this in case you're a bit sceptical about this. The five a day fruit and veg campaign uh, that we all know very well and has run for a number of years. Uh, research shows us that actually in both the UK and in the US, this campaign did a fantastic job of increasing our awareness and education around the role of eating fruit and veg every day. Um, an amazing job, in fact. Did it result in adults eating more fruit and veg? No. Um, why? Because, again, one plausible explanation of this is that our shopping behaviours and our cooking behaviours are largely habitual. So even though we build those nice, shiny new attitudes in people's minds, those attitudes are not salient 
at the moment they're in the shop or the moment they're at home cooking. Context rules those instead. Going on to the next slide, the third piece then, um, the third and last piece where we would say that behavioral science can potentially help is to think about adding something to the environment. Now, if we have the next slide, this is going to sound a little bit about semantics, um, but it's not. Um, let's imagine, for example, that um, tonight you decide you're going to have uh, soup for supper. Uh, you made a choice. You decide you're going to have tomato soup. You made another choice. You decide you're going to have Campbell's tomato soup. You made a third choice. When you go to the supermarket, though, you don't actually choose your soup. You pick it. You pick it because you'll just pick up one of the cans of Campbell's tomato soup at random. Now, this sounds like I say, a question of semantics. It is very important when we're thinking about what drives people's choices and behavior, because quite often we don't make the choice at the end. We pick at random. And that might be because we think, well, actually, we've narrowed down our choice set to a point now we don't need to worry too much about which one we now go for. Or it might be because we think it doesn't, um, we, we can't see the information that we want for that final step. One of those is called picking proper, which is when we decide it's not worth making the effort. And one is called picking by default, which is where we say, well, we've got no choice here, literally. We have to just pick at random. You could, of course, go to the supermarket with a tiny set of scales and measure every can of Campbell's soup to try and get an extra couple of grams of soup. Or you could look for dents or bits of rust, et cetera, but we don't do that. Now, this is quite important when we're thinking about, in effect, criticizing or lamenting the fact that we don't engage in certain behaviors. Because sometimes it's not that we choose not to, it's because we don't have that choice. Now, to give you an example of that, if we go on to the next slide, if you want to buy uh, any energy efficient products or appliances for your home, if you have the next slide, please. Um, you, can, you may want to choose energy efficient, but it's actually very difficult to choose the most energy efficient. Actually, it's impossible. You can go for a sticker that tells you that your new washing machine is in that top category, but there's a huge range of products in that top category, and you don't know the relative efficiency of this machine over another highly efficient machine. And so our question in one company with Envy that I'm involved with still in the US was, well, is this because people are picking proper because they can't be bothered? Or are they picking by default when it comes to energy efficiency because they don't have the information? And if it's the latter, if we then gave them the information, then we should see that actually the, the energy efficiency of products bought should increase. And so if, if we see the next slide, we spent a long time with scientists working out the relative energy efficiency of every single product in the market. So for the first time, rather than just going for an A triple star, um, you could then see, for example, from this washing machine scored, how it scores compared to every other comparable washing machine, so the same drum size, etc. The closer that number is to 100, the more energy efficient that product is. Now, what we saw as a result of doing this, we go on to the next slide, is that when we put that number against products, people buy more efficient products. Pretty much across most categories, about 20% more energy efficient. Just by giving them this little bit of information is what sometimes gets called as a boost, a crucial bit of information just in the right moment. And interestingly, again, in studies, when we control for the fact, uh, when we control, I should say, for environmental, uh, strong environmental uh, predisposition or strong views against sustainability, that makes no difference to people buying more efficient products. And there may be lots of reasons how this mechanism works, but crucially, we're not worrying about change, trying to change people's attitudes. We're simply giving them a little bit of extra information. So if we go on to the last slide uh, to wrap up, the, here are three ways in which I think science can help us. We can change the social context, we can change the physical context, or we could add something new to the context. These are all these to potentially bypass people's attitudes. But I will finish on saying that this is quite contentious. It does create a dilemma for those of us who are in the field of trying to change behavior, because many will say that unless we change attitudes to be very pro-sustainability, somehow these behavioral outcomes are slightly cheated in some way. And I'd say my response to that is possibly. I think these can be done well, but essentially I think we have to be pragmatic at this stage and say, well, whatever it takes to get us across the line should certainly be considered. Thank you.